We are back at it. Uh, Abba, yes, you're back. Yes, we are uh, in, in, still, we're we still in the you. continental United States. Okay, so welcome back to the program. You know, you, you made it back. Mordechai Shapiro is a tough act to follow, but you're back in your you're back in your spot. Okay, so getting to our first story for yeah. today. Obviously, what's going on what's going on in Turkey right. is has been really um, has been really the majority of the headlines that we're seeing. Yeah. And even as of ten minutes ago, I saw a headline that a earthquake was felt in Israel this, this morning. morning. Again, I didn't even um, see that. Let me look that up. Yeah, residents in Israel thirty thirty minutes ago. Residents in Israel report feeling another earthquake moments ago. So I don't know if this is all like shockwave. I don't know what it is exactly. Okay. But, they call it, uh, what do they call it? I think they call it aftershocks. Aftershock, yeah, I don't know, but you know the death toll when we when we first when we first were talking uh, the day after the earthquake happened, we were talking about a death toll around nineteen hundred and sixteen hundred. The death toll is you know is is likely, unfortunately, well over twenty thousand people, uh, which which is unimaginable it's 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 a it's a tragedy uh it's really really tragic and the, i think one of the most heartbreaking and tragic aspects of this whole thing is that you have probably tens of thousands of people are still trapped under rubble and they're alive right. people people were reported hearing hearing people screaming and they can't get to yeah. them they just can't get to them that's uh and that's, uh it's a it's it's like it's indescribable, actually. And you have teams from Israel, and you have everyone trying, but you have you have tons of, you know, how many tons of rubble that are just buried on top of people? You have thousands of buildings across Turkey that just collapsed. You know, listen, I don't think there's, there's so it's unavoidable. Nothing you can do about this. This is what you call a proverbial, actual, real uh, act of God, um, without putting myself in, in in God's shoes or trying to figure out his ways, which I think we've established over the years it's impossible for human beings to do. It's a proverbial act of God, and um, it's just uh, stunning. It, it, it's it's earth sh- it's a, not a, no, no pun intended. It's earth-shattering. That's what I wanted to, uh, what I wanted to say. And, uh, you know, I, I, the a lot of the problems uh, exist, I think, in Haiti, ten years ago, thirteen years ago, whenever it was, when they had a devastating earthquake, is because of the shoddy, con- shoddy, cheap construction, which uh, has buildings right. crumble instantaneously. I was talking to somebody this morning in Shul here. Uh, we were talking about the fact that in Israel, for the last many years, there is an effort, ongoing effort, to um, rebuild, uh, to re-strengthen buildings so that they become earthquake-proof. Uh, it's called the TAMA 38 program. It's a it's a complicated program that a lot of people in the United States invested in. It allows con- contractors to add two floors to every building while they're reinforcing the strength of the building so that they're earthquake proof. And in order to compensate the builders, it lets them sell those two new apartments on the top floors uh, of these buildings. So it's a creative business. It's a creative yeah. business concept, which is not what we're discussing right now. That's just by the way, uh, but. There is a there is a concerted effort uh, to strengthen buildings to prepare for this type of thing. Yeah, I mean, I don't know wh- how much strengthening of a building could withstand such a magnitude earthquake. Um, it's just you know, it, it, when when something like this happens, everyone's politics, religion, race, anything falls to the wayside, and everyone just tries to you know pitch in and help as much as possible. That's what we see going on in Turkey right now. Uh, there's a tweet the other day from Rabbi Mendi, uh, Mendi Khitrik from the Chabad in Turkey uh, that they saved. They saved uh, Svarm, the Sefer, Sefer Torahs uh, from the shul. Um, this community, they say, has been around for 2,500 years. So, so the, the, the earthquake was not centered in the capital of Istanbul. That's where uh, Rabbi Khitrik and the Chabad is, is located. Um, I don't think there are too many shluchim in, in Turkey, but certainly it must uh, must affect right. them in some way. Yeah, it's uh, it's really it's a scary it's a scary thing, and we ho- we hope everybody can be found safely. I, you know, I saw a video the other day, and I just can't imagine you have full families that are trapped under rubble, and you have you have the kids of the family that hear their parents yelling right. for help. 
And I just, I don't know how, like, we don't have the technology. We don't have anything that can remove this rubble to get to these people. There's nothing, there's nothing we can do to get to them. It's just, a, it's just a scary, scary, you know, reality. I know that, uh, I know that Israel rushed rescue crews into, uh, into Turkey. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, but the question is, I'm sure they didn't rush. Unfortunately, they could not rush rescue crews, rescue crews into, um, into Syria. Obviously, so right. I mean, who's in Syria? Because the, the the earthquake hit Syria as well. So uh, you don't hear too yeah. much about that. You only hear about Israel and Turkey. You don't hear about what's going on in Syria. I mean, Syria most yeah. of Syria has been falling apart because of the civil war for the last ten years. Anyway, yeah. but uh, this just this That's just true. adds to the pain and and to the sorrow. Well, we we hope we hope we hear good news out of these places, and they could rebuild. They say over twelve hundred buildings were have collapsed. Um, but going forward to our next story, um, famous famous podcaster celebrity Joe Rogan has on his show on Saturday, um, as we discussed previously on this program, Ilan Omar uh, had said it's all about the Benjamins, it's about the Jews, that it's all about the Benjamins, it's all about the money, uh, and Joe Rogan responded. To a to a guest on his podcast on his podcast, and he said it's ridiculous that to doubt that the Jews like money. Uh, he was discussing again her tweet being that it's all about the Benjamins, and Rogan said it's she's talking about money, and he said I don't think it's an anti-Semitic uh, statement. Benjamins are money. You know the idea that Jews are not into money is re- the, the idea that Jews are not into money is ridiculous. It's like saying Italians aren't into right. pizza. Well, that's pretty. Uh, that's so, pretty condescending too. Uh, he has a he, so he, yeah. he has a hundred million dollar contract with uh, Spotify, so uh, he's pretty uh, pretty secure. Uh, so let me so if you if you if you if you meet somebody that that you speak to or you know on a regular basis and they're really really dumb they're really dumb unfortunately is, is it okay to say to them you know I've been meaning to tell you you are really dumb you are really a dumb person is that how people are supposed to handle one another? You know, everything that they think and say, even if it might have some truth to it, you know? Yeah. And I don't, I don't, I also don't think he's cancelable. You mentioned he has a hundred million dollar contract yeah. with Spotify. He's also gotten into, he's gotten into trouble before with certain guests he's had on and things that he discussed during COVID. Um, but like he, he, he can get away with it. I, I don't think that he's an anti Semite. I think that he just really says whatever comes to his mind and he tries to be super, super honest. And he said that, listen, Jews like money. So yeah. But I think you know it, there's no place cool. for Elon Omar, who is a who is a member of Congress, to say that. Well, let's let's take that apart. Let's let's unpack that for a second, as they say. Um, it, it's the way you say it and what your attitude is that that the Jews that are minority population in the world have a uh, Baruch Hashem have a proclivity to, uh, of achieving some success uh, in business because of how diligent they are, how smart they are. And how aggressive they may be, and how focused they may be. You know, um, there was a story I told you here before about uh, when Eliezer Shkedi, who was the Air Force general in Israel, he wanted to bring uh, Hasidic young men, yeshiva men, into work uh, in the Air Force. And all the commanders of the Air Force bases said, you know, we can't have them in our Air Force base because they don't understand English and they don't know math. We have to have that for our people. He says, and Shkady said to the commanders in the Air Force bases, you're right, but they know how to study. They know how to learn. Yeah. And and he says, he put a bunch of yeshiva guys that were old enough to leave yeshiva. They left yeshiva. They went to work in the Air Force bases. He says, six months later, every commander called him and said, could you please get us more yeshiva guys? <laughs> That's great. So, it, yeah. so, well, our next so, story, no, so the point is this, our- Nafi. If, and there are societies that will tell you that because their Jews left uh, during the war, let's say, during World War II, during other times when there were revolutions, their society suffered because the Jews left. Not because the Jews brought uh, some kind of uh, financial mazel with them. The, the, when, a, when a Jewish community collapses or has to leave a country, look what's going on in Iran. Uh, the Jewish community there w- was, was really – was the model – that kept uh, the 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 country uh, uh, alive financially and economically and in terms of business. And it, it's a poor country where people don't have food to eat now because the Jewish community has yeah. dwindled. So, our next story is <coughs> yesterday morning. 
United Airlines flight turned around after a fire uh, started in the cabin. A fire on board New Jersey bound United Airlines plane prompted its return to San Diego International Airport on Tuesday morning. Four people were taken to the hospital for treatment for smoke inhalation. Really? Uh, flight 2664 was heading to Newark when a passenger's external battery pack caught fire shortly after takeoff. External battery pack is like, you know, those charger cases you put on yeah, your phone yeah. type. Uh, Carolyn Lipinski told KFMB TV that a few minutes after takeoff, a bag belonging to a first class pan- passenger began smoking. He threw something on the ground, and it was a battery charger pack or something from his laptop. It burst into fire. There was smoke in the cabin, and everyone was terrified. Uh, We were grasping, screaming. Flight attendants grabbed fire extinguishers and ran to the front of the plane. The crew placed the battery in a special fire bag, which prevented it from spreading, and the Boeing 737 returned safely to the airport. Um, They said four four, passengers were treated in the hospital for smoke inhalation. Wow. Probably more than anything, probably, you know, shock and fear. And, and, and like, that's a scary thing. Well, doesn't, All of a sudden, we're not going to, you're not going to be allowed to bring battery packs wait, on planes. The, doesn't everybody have these batteries on their phones and on their laptops and on their uh, iPads? Not everybody, but like, not everybody, but I think a lot of people do. I don't, I don't know. It might be a faulty, a faulty product for the, the fact that that happened. When I was in JFK yesterday. I noticed, uh, it's not the first time, but I noticed. It used to be that when you had an iPad or a laptop in your carry-on bag, you had to take it out and put it separately in one of those boxes to go through the x-ray machine. And now they don't do that. Now they yeah. don't do it anymore. Now they say if you have one such item in your carry-on, you can leave it in there. If you have two, one of, if you have more, if you have two such uh, pieces of equipment, you have to put it, take it out and, and, and put it into a separate uh, box for some reason. It probably comes from the same place as why you can't take a bottle of water. Uh, uh, into the plane with you for some reason. But if you buy the bottle of the water on the other side of the security uh, gate, then you can have a bottle of water with you. Maybe maybe it's yeah. just, maybe just increases water sales, uh, could be. They, they went to a couple of, a couple of trips to go. They, they confiscated the two yogurts from us before we reached security. Really? Yeah. And uh, Ema gave them the spoon. To, it was good yogurt. It was Bethel yogurt. So <laughs> she gave them the spoon, told them to enjoy it. If we can't take it on, you might as well eat it. Don't throw it in the garbage. It's good yogurt. Yeah, absolutely. This story is really, I don't know how he missed this. The story's from a little bit ago, though. Uh, we didn't mention this, but this is from a couple of weeks ago where a Philadelphia high school librarian was ordered to remove a poster with an Ellie Wiesel quote uh, because, of this, because of the violation of the school's policy on neutrality. Uh, a principal of high school in Bucks County ordered the school librarian to take down four posters with an Ellie Wiesel quote. The quote came from Wiesel, Wiesel's 1986 Nobel acceptance speech and reads, I swore never to be silent whenever, wherever human beings endure suffering, humiliation. We must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. So that was ordered to be taken down because it wasn't neutral. When Ellie Wiesel was really clearly talking about what he endured in the death camps created by the Nazis. There were, there were, it's a good statement. It's a fair statement. Uh, but it's not neutral. We should, you know, this, this is a big problem. Uh, you know, it's a problem in Israel uh, for many, many years that we're hoping will change now, but I'm not sure it's going to ever happen. But, um, you know, Israel's constantly dealing with terrorists. Hezbollah is a terrorist organization recognized internationally as terrorist. Hamas is recognized as a terrorist organization. But anytime they get into a fight with them, into a skirmish or into even a war, uh, the United Nations and the United States are always interested in fighting them to a draw. Don't defeat them. If you're going to defeat them, if you def- can, you imagine, can you imagine a Super Bowl this Sunday? The goal is to play the game and tie. At the end, it should be 21-21. And if someone defeats somebody... That's that's going to be terrible. They have to be condemned by the United Nations for using what they cause what they what they call in um in, what they call it they call it the inordinate uh, in, what they call it the inordinate amount of force. There's another word for it. Okay, excessive force. Excessive force, force or it, it, they're not they're not uh, fighting fairly. They have they have more strength than them. I'm sure somebody out there is saying the words right now, and I just can't uh, just escapes my mind at the moment. Okay. Yeah, so so you're saying that neutrality is not a good media to to have as a public 
Well, you know, it, it, it depends. If, if it's a if it's a, a battle between good and evil, what do you want? You want good and evil to uh, to both coexist equally. You want good to defeat e- the evil, don't you? Don't we? Shouldn't we want that in society? But I don't think we want that. I think it became politically correct to deal with these things and and even in some cases give evil a little bit of a uh, a benefit, uh, 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 an advantage is what I want to say, an advantage over good. There's something wrong with that, don't you think? Yeah. Did you know that, you know, Sakai Irving arrived in Dallas the other day and he spoke to the media, but did you know that Kyrie deleted his apology that he made in November about apologizing for the anti-Semitic film on Twitter. Did you know that he deleted that apology? I don't follow uh, Kyrie Irving's uh, Twitter account or his Facebook account or uh, other accounts uh, that he has. And we've had this conversation. Can you imagine? This conversation many, many times. If you want to talk about Kyrie Irving's uh, comments on his Twitter account, let's talk about uh, LeBron James, who broke the scoring record. Uh, yesterday, uh, who surpassed uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and uh, you know he surpassed uh, Michael Jordan, he surpassed uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, he surpassed Will Chamberlain, and a sports writer, I think, in the Wall Street Journal said that, you know, LeBron James really has no moves. <laughs> he has no moves except for brute force. You know, Will. Well, he is he is a he is a freak athlete. Will Chamberlain was the master of the of the dunk shot. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar had the sky hook. Uh, Michael Jordan had uh, an impeccable jump shot. Uh, what does LeBron James have except driving to the basket and knocking everybody else over and either laying the ball up and occasionally hitting a three when he gets lucky? Yeah, well, well, he no, he happens to be an, an incredible athlete. He could have probably been very successful in any sport. He probably could have been very successful in football um, as he was in high school. Um, but something interesting to note is that Lou Alcindor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, um, the three-pointer wasn't really around for most of his playing okay. career. So so the, the record, I don't know if it's real. I don't know if it's real numbers. He hit one three-pointer in his entire career. Um, well, obviously, LeBron James' whole career, the, the three-pointer has been there. So the points, of course, I mean, like, again, listen, it's a, it's a record that hasn't been broken for 40 years. So give him credit. But... Three point like Bobby Bond's home, it's like Bobby yeah. Bond's home run record, or Mark McGuire's home run record. The saying is not fair. Barry, Barry Bonds. Did I say? Did I say uh, Bobby? What is it? Barry Bonds. Barry Bonds, right? You said Bob. You said yeah. You His said Bobby. father was Bobby Bonds. His father was also a home run. Oh, oh yeah. really? Well, good morning. His father was Bobby Bonds. He was a home run hitter too, but he wasn't juiced up. <laughs> well, he wasn't yeah. juiced up like Barry Bonds and 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 Mark McGuire. What else you got? What else yeah, you got? So, I know, so LeBron James, he's a dominant force on the court, but he doesn't have the style and the grace and the panache of a Michael Jordan or, or of a, a Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And Will Chamberlain scored 100 points in a game, all on dunk shots. Will Chamberlain was the worst three-throw sh- throw shooter in the, in the history of the NBA. I know, but, uh, but also there was nobody playing against Will Chamberlain. There's a bunch of like, no what are you names. talking about? The big thing it about Will Chamberlain was that he was seven foot one. Today, everybody's seven foot one. Yeah, but then nobody was. I don't know what I don't know what changed. But, anyways, um, I I've watched many State of the Union addresses from different presidents. Uh-huh. Never have I se- never have I seen one so like combative. Like the 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 Republicans in the chamber were really like going at. Going at Biden last night as he was giving the State of the Union, they're calling him a liar. Um, what do you think about that? Well, um, I think most of what he said uh, was not true. Uh, he distorts uh, the reality to his uh, favor. For example, he's the first American president to reduce the deficit by one point four trillion dollars. You know how he did that? Because we spent almost uh, five trillion dollars. Uh, to save the country during COVID. So we're not spending it now. So he takes credit for that. For <laughs> He takes credit for reducing the spending. There's nothing more dishonest for a president of the United States that's supposed to be an example of morality for the people. Forget about morality. But there's nothing more that, that, that could illustrate a dishonesty than saying something like that. And if the Democrats share that, of course, you know, if you have, uh, if you spend $1,000 today, 
you know, and you don't spend the same thousand dollars tomorrow, I mean, you saved a thousand dollars, right? You 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 reduce you reduce you your spending. You, 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 didn't, you may you actually the president of the United States would say, well, today, uh, yesterday, I I spent a thousand dollars. Today, I made a thousand dollars. How'd you make a thousand dollars? I didn't spend it. That's how I made a thousand dollars. But uh, that's yeah. that's a distortion of the reality and. And uh, there's many other things that he said that uh, were just not true. Anyway, if you have nothing else on your list, there's two things I want to bring up very quickly, very interesting, that I read this morning. Let's hear Number it. one is about uh, Israel's foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia and Vladimir Putin. Netanyahu, Bibi Netanyahu and Vladimir Putin were, used to be very close. And Russia, the relationship between Russia, mostly because of all the Russian Jews and Israel, was a very good one. But now, lately, uh, Israel, which resisted supporting Ukraine in the war, is is changing a, a little bit for a couple of reasons, uh, and not because they want, not because they're big fans of uh, Zelensky uh, and, and the Ukraine, but first of all, uh, it used to be um, there's two there's two reasons, two very interesting reasons why that dynamic is shifting. Uh, one is I have to remember both. One is that. Um, it used to be that there were a lot of Russian troops in Syria because they were big supporters of uh, uh, Bashar Assad, the Syrian dictator. But a lot of those, a lot of those Russian troops are now gone uh, because uh, they're fighting the war against Ukraine. So Israel doesn't have that threat of Russia helping Syria. So the Syrian army is disorganized and weak. They have no match for the state of Israel for the IDF. And now that the Russians are gone, mostly gone. Because they're trying to fighting in Ukraine, it shifts Israel's interest in uh, having a good relationship with Russia, uh, because um, uh, because they they have a presence in Syria. And second of all, um, Netanyahu it was written by a writer I forgot where I think in Haaretz I think it was in Haaretz, who said that um, Syria uh, is manufacturing um, killer drones for Russia to use against the Ukraine. And that's a very lethal weapon. It's a drone that crashes into a site, to a building, and blows up the building. And Israel, Israel wow. never saw how that uh, that Iranian now Iran has always threatened to destroy Israel. And Israel never knew what kind of weapons they had and how to deal how to deal with it. But now that Syria is and now that Iran is producing those weapons for Russia to use in the Ukraine, Israel has a better idea of how to deal with those types uh, of weapons. So that's another uh, uh, reason why the, um, the support in the war between Russia and the Ukraine is slightly tilting uh, from Israel in the direction of, uh, of the Ukraine. Not because Vladimir Zelensky is Jewish and Israel doesn't know anything to uh, Ukraine, uh, uh, you know, because uh, Zelensky happens to be uh, Jewish, married to a non-Jew with children that were baptized, blah, blah, blah. So that's just an observation that I, I wanted to make. Um, and then I just wanted to say, can I, you have anything else you want to bring up? Okay, no. so we're, it's Wednesday, so we have a, a, a momentous Pasha coming up in Pasha's Yisro, okay? Uh, what's the greatest thing about Pasha's Yisro? Uh, Yisro has, Pasha's Yisro has the Aserus of Divros. The Ten Commandments are in Pasha's Yisro. So the, the question that's commonly asked is, how is it that the Aserus of Divros, the high point of the giving of the Torah by Hashem to the Jewish people, why is it placed in a Pasha named after the greatest idol worshiper in the history of the world. What kind of schus did he have right. to have the Aserus Dibras in a Pasha named for him? And uh, I think the Lubavitch Rebbe said about that, uh, there's a message somewhere uh, in there. And the message is that when you adhere to, when you do Torah mitzvahs, when you do the mitzvahs, when you adhere to the Aserus Dibras, if you do it for any other reason than the fact that it is actually sincere and absolutely the Shema, then there's an element of idol worship in that act. If to give you an example, if you have if you knock yourself out to buy a beautiful lulu because not because you want to do a a, a, a mitzvah nice, but because your neighbor has a nice uh, a nice lulu, you want to have a nicer one than him. So you're you have an ulterior motive. It it's good. You 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 kind the mitzvah and then you're doing a great thing, but your motivation is kind of Yisroish, has a little bit of Yisro in there. So that message is subliminally communicated to us by having Yasser Sedibros in, in that pressure. Thank you, everybody, for listening and watching. This is The Daily Thread, and we hope to see you again tomorrow. Have a good day, everybody.